All right, everyone. Today, I have uh, a couple of great guests for you on our uh, interview for today's episode. Uh, today, I have on brothers Joel and Luke Hayes. They're personal trainers uh, specializing in obstacle course racing and hybrid competitions, as well as tactical competitions with their company, Trio Fitness Training. They've been racing in OCR competitively since 2017. And uh, more since the more recent growth of hybrid events, they've competed in a dozen events and coached athletes to the DECA World Championships, as well as other hybrid competition. Their specialty is tailoring training specifically to individual athletes, uh, individual athletes, so the athlete is put in the best possible position to progress and succeed. So, uh, Joel, Luke, thanks so much for joining me on today's episode. Absolutely. Appreciate you having us. Yeah, this is going to be a good one. A lot of great uh, topics I want to get to. Uh, but first, uh, I would just love for you guys to kind of let our listeners know a little bit how you got into OCR hybrid events. If uh, uh, Joel, let's start uh, with you first on just kind of how you got into the sport. Sure. Uh, so I back in 2015, I can't remember if I was still in college or just got out of college. Uh, but anyway, Luke, I think brought it up. So we have a, a bunch of brothers, another one of them. <laughs> he is also a personal trainer. So at, at the same time, we all lived in the DC area and all worked at separate Gold's gyms. Um, so we had like a monopoly going there for a while, but I think Luke brought it up and said, Hey, we should do a Spartan race. Cause he had done a, a warrior dash or something prior. Yeah. Um, so we all signed up and did the Spartan sprint, uh, in DC, uh, it was in Maryland, but they called it the DC sprint, I believe. And then we're like, well, we did one. We got to go for the trifecta now ended up doing the trifecta. And then the next year we ran a few more along with the savage, um, and then I think at that Savage race, I know it was for me, I can't remember for Luke, but um, in the overall placement, I think we were in the teens or close to 10, somewhere in there for overall. And both of us were kind of like, man, I think if we trained specifically for this, we could do pretty well. Uh, so at least for me, that was like the race that decided that I, I really wanted to like try and be competitive at it. Um, yeah, so that's how it kind of awesome. all got going. Cool, Luke. So it sounds like you you kind of got into it a little bit earlier. Yeah. So I did. Excuse me, my voice. But I did start with a warrior dash, but that was um just for fun with some work friends, and that was like that was a mud run. I mean, we left there literally covered in mud, head to toe. Not, and it was just for fun. I don't think I don't know if there was a competitive heat or not, but um, and then after that, I ended up doing the Spartan Winter Green Super, which uh, that was in 2014. And I had no clue what I was getting into because I didn't run at all. At that time, I only did um, basically like bodybuilding, you know, just strength training workouts a couple times a week, like three or four um, and no cardio. I intentionally avoided it because I didn't want to lose my gains, which obviously that's not true, but that's just uh, the mentality I had at the time. And it's not right, but um anyway so yeah i did the winter green super and i mean it was absolutely crazy at one point there was a one mile just like uphill vertical on a double black diamond hill and like my legs were just roasted and the obstacles were a lot different than um and a lot harder that's for sure and like there was a log carry um and that was up one of the hills <clears throat> people were dropping those and they were going flying down everybody would just be like log and then you'd have to like <laughs> jump out of the way but it would fly down and a couple cars got hit at the bottom which is just crazy um but yeah so that was that was cool that was just for fun um and then when i realized that i wanted to compete in ocr was um i don't remember what race it was but Faye Stenning came flying past us. And when she came I by, know race that was. when she came by, she was breathing like so heavy. It sounded like she was about to die, but she just kept going and like just flew past us up this hill. And I'm like barely able to walk up this thing without stopping. And it was just like, that is so cool. And I think after that, I was like, you know what? I want to try and like be able to push myself that hard. That'd be cool that's that's funny you say that i i i'm pretty sure it was bay um one of the first competitive heats i did with spartan um i was 
near the finish line. I, I would say less than a half a mile and I can see her coming. And I'm like, I can't, can't let her beat me. She started what, 15 minutes after me? And she yeah. just smoked me. It just, yeah. Yeah. And it, it looked like she was barely trying as she just, I was walking probably at that point, but uh, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> it's funny how you get motivated there. Yeah. Um, the, uh, it, it's pretty cool to see the, you know, you brought up like the logs and how the obstacles have, uh, they've stayed the same, but they've changed a little bit. I saw somebody post um, on Facebook or somewhere like remember when the rope climbs used to be in water and I'm like that's yeah. right like you had to come yeah. out of the mud and yeah. I think you know it was cool to have those crazy obstacles but at the same time they're probably like we can't keep doing this we people are going to throw logs they're going to fall and that's I mean that's yeah. exactly what happened so it's crazy the change <clears throat> yeah. it's made over the years for sure um how many brothers do you guys have <laughs> so there's five of us yeah all right five are you guys boys. pretty competitive Fairly. It depends um, on it depends on the thing, but yeah, fairly. Okay. So do all of them race? Oh no. No. Okay. <laughs> so the, yeah, the bottom three of us are trainers and then um the oldest two haven't I don't think they've ever done any races or anything. Uh, yeah. And then the other brother who did the first several races with us, I don't think he's done one for a while. He still like says he'd like to do more, but I just think okay. he doesn't hasn't had the time or hasn't had anything to deal with yeah a bunch yeah. of slender yeah. things yeah <laughs> yeah um so tell me a little bit about trio fitness training so this is uh uh you guys both work with this company is that correct yep uh luke do you, do you want to take it or me you can it's fine uh so it's it's our company we started it um years ago um, I don't even remember what year, maybe 2017. Oh, 15. 15. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So initially it started out, we just like, uh, wanted to have an online place where we could train people and it didn't start out specifically for obstacle course racing. But then once we got into it, we were like, Hey, this is what we're passionate about now. This is what we would like to help people with because initially we were in the open heats and even later on, we were at races for hours and hours and hours on the weekend. So we would see the obstacles that people were having problems with. So then we started tailoring trio, trio specifically to obstacle course racing. Um, and it was geared pretty much only to that for several years. And then when hybrid came around, um, Luke started doing more hybrid events. And I couldn't for a while um, when the pandemic happened and everything. And then once... Uh, I could get, make it to some events. I, uh, tried a DECA, had a lot of fun, tried more, started doing some more of them. And so we were like, you know what, um, we should just branch it out into hybrid obstacle course racing. And then I like doing tactical competitions and the training is actually very similar to hybrid training. So we also do some coaching for that as well. Um, but the whole point of what we do, uh, is like, specific customized training online for athletes because like over the years I've looked around for companies or people who do very specialized training where they actually gear towards the athlete and I haven't really found or seen anyone who does it very well online I've seen a lot of companies who build stock programs and then just change a few things here and there. And they'll schedule these things out for weeks and weeks on end and just give them to a person and be like, all right, do that without necessarily following up and figuring out if the person can even do the first week of that, much less the next week, the next week, the next week, and so on. So um, we pretty much program week by week. Like we have a, a macro version or a macro vision of what their training looks like. But almost every week, someone will like reply to me about the training that I put up and be like, well, I struggled with this thing this week. I wasn't able to quite do what you listed or the weight or the reps or whatever. So the next week I can go in and change that up so that they are able to do it. And it's still challenging, but it's not just like, oh, I can't do it. This is pointless. So we really tailor literally every aspect of the training to the person, whether it's the the exercise, the equipment, like 
We have people fill out a very detailed survey when they sign up that talks about their training background, what equipment they have access to, where, what type of terrain as far as like hills, roads, trails, whatever they have access to, what their goals are. And we gear everything towards what they have and what their goals are. So I think, I think as far as I know, we're the only online business who literally tailors everything towards that. And I think that's extremely important because then people are able to progress at a very specific level that matches what they're capable of. And then they're able to best achieve results that way. Awesome. Do you, uh, so do you guys see some common maybe mistakes or misconceptions that people have coming into training for a race? Maybe specifically if it's their first time training for one of these races, um, any specific things that you just kind of see a theme of, yeah, a lot of people just tend to fall into these traps or whatever it might be. I think one of the most common things I see, especially in uh, like DECA and hybrid, well, I mean, it applies to OCR just as much, but um, a lot of people will go on like Instagram and they'll see what some of the pros are doing in their heats, like, um, you know, go going through an obstacle super smooth or doing the sled in high rocks at like a really good pace. And they'll think that's what they're supposed to be able to do. And then they'll go ahead and try that and they'll burn out like immediately and then be crashed for the rest of the race. So that's what I see most of, especially um, with DECA, same thing. Like you watch somebody go on the rower and they're going like all out. And it's like, hold on, that's the second zone. <laughs> You've still got <laughs> eight more to go. So mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I think those are the people you, you can spot right away when they're hitting mm -hmm. zones one, two, three, and it's like, oof. They're either a, a freak and they're going to just crush a time or more likely we're going to see a di different picture in about five minutes. And I think that's with the hybrid events. People have a, a hard time figuring out. I think that's true in obstacle course racing, too, because <clears throat> like um, that was one of the biggest lessons I had to learn. And that's one of the lessons I have to teach almost every person that we've trained for obstacle racing who wants to do it fast uh, is pacing because most people come out and they're super excited the start line you know the dj's trying to hype you up which is awesome um but then you kind of get too hyped up and you go out really fast and uh yeah within mile one you're burned out you're you you already gassed yourself out and so you suffer through the rest of the race whereas if you had paced yourself properly according to whatever fitness level you built up you can be much more consistent, much more effective through the whole course of the race and much faster going through it. So I think, I think that's probably the biggest thing for people who want to be competitive. And then for athletes who are more just going out to do it, challenge themselves and have fun. I think a lot of the upper body obstacles are where people fail. And I think they uh, just don't know exactly how to train for those things to improve their upper body strength, their grip strength, and their technique on obstacles. So that would be the, for the general populace who's just trying to go out, have a good time. I think that's the probably the biggest thing where they struggle. Absolutely. Uh, I w going back to, I like your, your, what you guys were saying with pacing and figuring it like one, I think a trap a lot of people fall into is they go on social media and they see whether it's the the actual event or they see the training some of those people do and no, unless you're at that level, like you're probably not following a workout like that, like understanding how to scale it a little bit. But, um, but that idea of pacing, do you, do you think there's any specific strategies somebody can follow to help, help them figure that out? Or do you think it's more an experience thing? Like you kind of learn, learn things like that. I don't know if you have any insight to help people maybe find a good a good you know i don't want to go too slow but yeah i can't go too fast either so for myself and uh what i do with a lot of my clients um you can use a heart rate monitor um but a lot of times what i also focus on is just like how you feel and rpe basically scale of one to ten of intensity um and so for something like a deca strong you're going to be at like a really high intensity but not you're just not crossing that line. You're like right at the edge of the line to where you can barely hang on, but you can hang on. And then if you cross that line, then you're going to have to slow down or burn out or whatever. So that's uh, 
practicing that and and intentionally having that in workouts and having them practice that intensity and being able to move consistently like through a circuit or something right so you don't have any given rest you just go one, from one thing right into the other right into the other just like a hybrid event <clears throat> Um, and keeping the same level of intensity the whole time. And really, it does take just a lot of practice and kind of getting used to it. Yep. Yeah, that's something that <clears throat> for all the hybrid athletes, uh, especially ones doing DECA, like so the other week, um, one of our obstacle course racing athletes uh, this year decided she wanted to try some hybrids. So she wanted to try a DECA strong and she did her first one. And we talked about pacing a ton leading up to it. And in her training, I was talking to her about like, all right, so these first few zones, if you go hard in them, you will blow up. It's just a guarantee. So if you, if you outpace your fitness level, you're going to blow up. And she practiced it in training a lot, but it's still not the same as when you go out there on race day. Like I said, with, even with OCR, the energy's high, maybe you're nervous going into it because you want to do well. And so after her first race, she's like, yeah, I think I went a little too hard in the first few zones because coming into like four, five, six, I was already feeling a little bit gassed. I was like, well, yeah, there's the, there's the pacing, but you can train for it. But I think having some in race experience goes a long way as well. So you can going into your first one, you can have the idea, you can know roughly where those numbers are, but until you've done the full 10 in a row, in the race environment, you probably don't know exactly how it is. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think those are all great tips. I know, um, I always try and like, obviously you, you, you know, heart rate's great. I love, uh, you know, I, I am kind of a numbers guy and I like seeing numbers. It just helps me know, Oh, I'm, I'm hitting 95%. I'm kind of screwed right now or no, I'm right where I need to be. But you know, sometimes you, you're not checking your heart rate the whole time and I don't have an easy way to, to see it sometimes using the equipment, right? Like, okay, I'm on the rower. The yeah. more I do the rower, the more I know my pacing, you know, if I'm hitting, if I'm at like a 140 pace, I'm in trouble, right? I, there's no way I can maintain this um, more than, you know, 30 seconds or so. But I, and I think experience too, right? Is the more you start to know those numbers. So I try and tell clients at least like a salt bike, rower, skier, the ones you see those numbers, like just know, even in training, right? We'll have people doing, you know, maybe half mile sprints or mile sprints on the assault bike and they go all out right in the first 10 seconds. And it's like, slow, yeah. slow, slow. You're going to yeah. thank me later. You just can't keep this up. And I just think, um, but like, I, but like you said, race day comes and it's really hard because your people are yelling at you. Like you're pumped. You want to do well. And I think that's, it's hard to, to manage both those like paying attention to numbers how you feel the adrenaline um yeah. but those are all i think it's just practice right the more you do it the better you get out of yeah yeah it, it is definitely a huge part mental too because when you're like in a deck of strong when you're on the rower you should be pretty comfortable for the most part and like for most people it feels too comfortable and then you're sitting there doing it and you're like i need to be going faster because this is a race and I'm trying to get the fastest time I can. And here I am just like feeling like I can go faster, but I'm not supposed to. So in your mind, it just kind of messes with you a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. It takes, it takes self-discipline to know what your numbers are from your training. And then when you get to the actual event to stick to those numbers, even if you feel like you could do more because doing the more is probably where you burn out. Yeah. And I think a lot of people need to hear that <laughs> kind of like, Trust the process, right? Trust yourself that you're doing. You you put the work in that. As soon as you get off your game plan, now you're relying on grit and you know yeah. whatever you got down there, and and that's just not a good. Unless you're on like the last zone or station or the last little right. sprint, that's fine. But any other place, you're in trouble for sure. Yeah. Um, so I I think uh you know kind of on this topic, do you guys get a lot of individuals training? for both a hybrid event and an OCR and kind of switching back and forth? Is that something you see a lot nowadays? So we have, we have a handful that do that. Sometimes it's funny because sometimes they'll sign up for training for obstacle course racing. And then after a while, they'll see some of our posts from hybrid events and be like, Oh, that looks interesting. I want to try one of those. Can we do that? Just, yeah, sure. We can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely. <laughs> uh, so there's a handful. Uh, it's not the majority. Um, so like 
Luke focuses most on the DECA stuff because uh, that's what he's most passionate about. I really like hybrid, but I also really love running longer distances. So I, I tend to take more of the obstacle course horse racing athletes, especially if it's like a longer event, like an ultra. Um, but yeah, we get crossover and uh, I'm probably losing my thought right here. So, yeah, do you any specific, whether they're strategies, tips for people? Because I, I do, I think the more and more popular hybrid is getting, you, you get people bouncing back and forth. Um, and obviously there are similarities with the two, but they're, it's different, right? If you're training for a um, half marathon OCR versus a deck of strong, right? There's components that will cross over, but that's a different style of training. So do you, I just like to get other coaches input on this. Any, any thoughts on like, okay, I have a client or I have somebody that wants to do these two extremes any recommendations on how I balance that or do you kind of go all in on one and the other one's just for fun or, you know, any, any thoughts on that? So I do have a specific client who's literally doing that and it's actually really fun coaching him. So he's working uh, on uh, improving his deck of strong. And he's also uh, trying to do the Killington super this summer. And he did the same thing last year too. So that is quite a different extreme there. And it is um, tough to find the balance, but I think it's just um, really just dialing into like a slow progression over time, because if you go too intense on either one, then it's going to negatively affect the other one. So, I mean, that's a, that's just a talk you have to have with the client though, is it, which one do you prioritize or do you want to care equally about them both? And then from there you can adjust. So right now he wants to do well at both which is cool and that's fine, but it is a fine balance. And again, you really like just have to keep the intensity a little bit more moderate overall. You can still push some good efforts, but if you go too hard, then like if you do a really hard deck of workout, you're not going to be able to do your long run. You know what I mean? Or vice versa. So you just have to balance it out a little bit more and it will take a little bit longer, but I mean, it's cool to be working towards those two goals. I think that's awesome. Yeah, I think what's cool about <clears throat> kind of how the obstacle course racing athletes have started morphing into hybrid athletes um, is they get good at a lot of things. And I, for people who want to do multiple, I tell them, like, if you don't have one that you want to do more than the other, and we're generalizing here, then just know that when you generalize that much, you're not going to be the best you could be at either one. You can still get very, very good at both it'll take longer because you're doing two different types of training and you're not specializing, but you can get great at both. Um, so yeah, like Luke said, it comes down to talking with the athlete and just being honest and saying, Hey, you know, if you want to do a Killington race and also be at DECA world championship, like this is going to be a process and it's going to be hard, uh, cause you're doing two different different styles of training, two things that require different, uh, different methods of training. One's a lot of running and the others, if you're doing a strong, there's no running. So yeah, just being honest with the athletes. And then it's, I've, I don't think I've ever told an athlete, no, <laughs> as far as like, I want to do this thing. I, I don't think I've ever said, nah, that's not going to work. Uh, I'm more like, okay, but here are the expectations for that thing, just so you know, so you're not like expecting to be on the podium of an ultra and also on the podium of a decade in the same year. It can happen, uh, but less likely if you're not already good at both of those things. Yeah, yeah, I, I, those are all great points. And I think that's, that's the important thing is realizing, yeah, if you train, train generally, you get generally good at yeah, things. Yeah, when some people, yeah. if that's all they care about, they just wanna, I just wanna do a lot of races, have fun. I'm not going to win anything. And I just want to go out there and not hurt myself. Like hundred percent, you can do those yeah. things. But if you get to the point where you're like, maybe I do want to get a little bit serious about this picking a side again, you don't have to give up anything, but you're just saying, I need to go a little bit more all in on this, this one. And, and Luke, I like that you brought up the idea of it. It's probably going to take longer, right? I, it's not like I have eight weeks. I can commit to this one thing. It's like, well, I have these, very varying goals this might be a six month 
process yeah. of getting really good, like allowing my body to adapt to all these different things. So I, I think that's just something people need to hear. It's it's like, cool, you can definitely do these things unless you're an outlier. You probably want to specialize at some point if that's what your priority is. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, all right. Well, you guys are working on a, a really cool project that I wanted to make sure we we talk about. So uh, the OCR's greatest project, um, I don't know who wants to take the lead on this, but tell us a little bit more about what you guys have going on. Yeah, so OCR's greatest is a competition that we came up, um, came up with uh, basically to help grow the foundation of OCR, which is the small and local OCR brand. So Everybody knows Spartan Race, everybody knows Tough Mudder, everybody knows Savage, but there are over a hundred small OCR brands in the U.S. that are putting on really good events of all different levels. Some of them are like super easy kind of mud runs. Others are like really intense and have fire and machine guns and stuff like that. And it's like, so those brands, they don't get, get enough attention. Like anybody who knows about OCR probably found out about through Spartan or Tough Mudder or whatever. And that's like for me, um, from the com competitive aspect, that's all I knew and that's all I paid attention to because I didn't think anything about these local OCRs because like they're not, I don't know, it wasn't like a big competition thing. All I focused on was competition. But um, and there are a lot of competitive ones too. Some of them have prize money um, and they also have like really awesome obstacles and stuff like that. So I wish if I could go back when I was spending all this time on OCR, I wish I had spent more time with some of the local ones. It was just like, it was just where my mind was at. It. You know what I mean? It was just focused on competition. Um, but what we're trying to do is like really help uh, from a community aspect. So OCR's Greatest is a competition where if you uh, complete any of the races on like any local OCR race in the U.S., you then email us that um, race result and you get 10 points, okay? So that's how the competition works. It's that easy. You just participate in the race. The incentive is for as many athletes as possible to participate in these local OCRs. And the more local OCRs that you do, you climb the leaderboard. And then at the end of the year, we have a prize pool for the top athlete. And that's just one athlete because it's not male or female. It's just one overall, whoever does the most OCRs. Um, and the prize pool is made up of local OCR um, entries for 2025. And they've all donated that because they see how this is like a cool way for the local OCR community to get together. Um, especially just like, I'm not trying to bash Spartan because I do like them a lot, but every time they make a change, like the paying for pictures or removing burpees or whatever, people always complain about it, which I get. You know, you have a right to complain, but it's like, if you don't like it, what are you going to do about it? Either you stop mm -hmm. OCR or you find other OCRs to do. And it doesn't seem like people know um, about all these other events that exist out there. So we're just trying to bring um, more awareness to that, basically, in a, in a fun community type of way. That's awesome. So uh, this will only count towards those local events. So if they do a Spartan, Tough Mudder, any of the bigger ones, no points there, only smaller events. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we have a rule book on our page that explains, um, I think it's um, three races maximum that they hold in a calendar year. That's our limit. So if a brand holds more than three races, then they're not um, uh, counted as a local OCR. Okay. Don't quote him on that, but yeah, I'm pretty sure I think he's wrong. right on that. But the rule book is on the webs, uh, on the page for it, and uh, yeah, so all, the definition of what we're defining as a small race is on there. Yeah, okay. something like Spartan or Savage doesn't qualify. Okay, okay, perfect. I'll make sure we put um everything the the website on the show notes for this this episode so people can check that out. Um, awesome. So. Uh, now I lost my train of thought. I want to ask you Sorry. guys on this. Um, oh, so let's say, like, how are you, um, are you guys listing all of the races you know about on the website? Or is this something, hey, I found a local race and I'm going to just give you the, the race results? Both? So um, every year <clears throat> for the past three or four years now, I've been writing an article on our blog called The Big List of Smallest CRs. It's just in the USA. 
I don't really have time to do it for the whole world. <laughs> uh, and the USA is enough research time. Um, so on that list this year was about a hundred races. So anything from that list is good. Um, that's on our blog. I believe I have that linked on the page as well. And then on the bottom of OCRS greatest page, um, I put together a map and one by one added them to the map. So there's, there were only a few where I couldn't add them for some reason, some glitch or something, but there's like 90 plus of them listed on that little map on there too. So then you get at least a visual, you know, if I live in Texas, here's what's roughly around me. Um, but yeah, so there's over 90 on that map, a hundred roughly on the article we put out. So there's a lot for people to choose from. Awesome. And if, uh, let's say, a, look, a local company's listening and they want to be added to it, they can reach out to you, I'm assuming. And yep. um, Yeah, that actually yeah. just happened this last week. Someone commented on the article in a Facebook group where we put it and said, hey, can we get added to this list? And I was like, sure, what's your event? And they put the link on there and I got it added. So, yeah. Okay, if awesome. If they qualify, then yeah, we'll put them on there. Happy to do it. All right. Yeah, that um, that goes for any participants as well. If you participate in a race or found one you're going to participate in, you can, um, if it's a small local OCR in the U.S. and follows those guidelines we have in the rule book, then you can just email us the re results link, just like we have for every other race, and it will be counted for it. So, because yeah. we're not going to find every single one that there is out there. Sure. Um, and also, because we're already in March, almost April now, any races that qualify that have already happened and people have done those, they can like retroactively send us those links and be counted for the points as well. Yeah. Awesome. If somebody's yeah, like, they can be sent, they can be sent at any point during the year, as long as it's before the end of the year. <clears throat> so if someone did 50 of them and didn't send any emails in until December, it's going to be a lot of work for us to uh, put it all together then but they can realistically do that we'll so if you've say, done don't, a race don't do you that. haven't sent it in yet you're still good <laughs> to send it. yeah uh and it, it does uh is this strictly ocr do you would you if there's like a local hybrid event um are you counting those or only traditional OCR? just ocr for this okay okay cool yeah cool awesome so if people do want to check out uh all the rules the the um the uh are you listing the standings or anything like that public publicly we have a leaderboard yeah the yep. leaderboard, leaderboard is, yep. the leaderboard's yeah. on the page so where do they go to check all that that stuff out trio fitness yeah so it's, <laughs> trio so it's fitness. true fitness training.com slash ocr is greatest okay awesome and I'll, if you I'll put go on trio fitness training.com it's one of the tabs at the top of the page so it's it's right there awesome Awesome. And do you guys have any other links, resources, or ways people can uh, follow you guys to to see what you're doing and what content you're putting out there? Yep. Uh, yeah, so we so have we, Instagram, Facebook, we, Trio Fitness Training. Uh, I think we're the only Trio Fitness Training out there. So if you type that in, it should come up with us. Um, uh, yeah, we have a blog on our page and we put out, we're at like 250 some articles over the years now. So there's tons and tons of articles for training tips uh everything from like spartan sprint to an ultra to hybrid to trail racing uh nutrition hydration during races pretty much anything you can think of in racing we've done articles it's very hard to come up with new topics at this point <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah yeah so social <laughs> media the website any of that awesome uh and actually uh Last thing. So out of all the races you guys done, specifically local ones, do you guys have a favorite favorite race you've done yet? Oh, so uh, I used to live in Virginia and there was a race at a park right next to where I lived. And I used to run there all the time for training. And then I found out they had a race there and did that. I really liked it partly because I knew the course so well. Mm -hmm. um, it's called the Mad Anthony Mud Run. It's not a hard race at all. It's uh, more of a beginner one, but it was a great local race. And then um, more recently, sadly, it's not hosting any more events, but it was called Myrtle Beast and it was in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And it was a really cool course with good obstacles and a cool setup, a little different setup than normal. Um, yeah, those two were awesome. That's that's the exact one I was gonna say the Myrtle Beast because it was it was 
uh, structured in a way that no other OCR that I have done has has been set up like that. It was kind of like uh, a zigzag. You would have very straight running courses, the obstacles. There weren't, you, they did have one hill actually, but it wasn't like a terrain thing. It was just running back and forth kind of in a zigzag and the obstacles were laid out in a way so that you could like really pick up speed on the straightaways, kind of try and hammer the obstacles and you'd have to do a turnaround. But it was just a very unique way to do a 5K OCR and their obstacles were really cool too. The people were nice. They talked to us before and afterwards. It was just uh, kind of disappointing that they're not happening, but you know, it was, it was cool. Awesome. So what event has machine guns? Uh, that's uh, uh, more X. X. So, more X. Yeah, yeah. War X in Ohio. So we, man, I I so badly want to get out there. I've talked to the race uh, director. I'm not sure if he's the owner also, but I've talked to him. I was like, I really want to get out there. Uh, it's kind of, it probably won't work out this year again, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, they have flamethrowers. We had a client do their race last year and she loved it because they have a lot of unique obstacles. Yeah, they do machine gun fire in the background. And then one of their races, uh, I think it's a two mile one. They have you shoot a rifle as a part of it. So yeah, it's a very unique, cool one. It's put on by uh, a lot of veterans. So they just make it awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I figured I had to ask about that. One. I hadn't heard machine guns in a race before. So very <laughs> cool. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to put links to everything so people can, uh, learn more about this, uh, super cool thing, check out local races, learn new obstacles. Um, yeah. really cool that you guys are putting this on. So Joel, Luke, thank you so much for your insight and doing all this work and, uh, and coming on the podcast today. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for, for having us, Mike. Mike.